Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Vintage Church. If I've never met you before, my name is Dustin Turner. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church. If you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. That's where we're going to be today. If you're new to the Bible, that's more toward the back end of your Bible. And if you need a copy of God's Word, lift up your hand. Our Connect team would love to get you a copy, either in English or Spanish, because we have the awesome opportunity to translate all of my messages during our 10 a.m. gathering into Spanish. If you are new or you're looking for resources, you want to catch up, you can find everything online. You're going to see a QR code on the screen. You can scan that. You'll also see a link. There are sermon notes, our V-group study, videos, audio. There's some recommended books on there as well as we go through this series called The Unexpected Journey. And what we've been talking about over the last four weeks in this series is what it looks like to grow. Just like we have physical development, physical growth, at the same time, we also have spiritual development, spiritual growth, spiritual formation. And so week one, we talked about rebirth. We talked about how we all have to have a new birth. Jesus called it to be born again or born from above. And then we talked about in week two, how we begin to develop as young children following the Lord. Last week was kind of, okay, now we're going into teenagers, adolescents. What does that look like? How do we begin to develop there. This week, we're kind of piggybacking off of that idea. And what we're going to be looking at is like, listen, when you're growing, when you're developing, this is what maturity, this is what being a spiritual adult should look like. And so Galatians chapter 5, if you're familiar with that passage, the Apostle Paul talks about the fruit of of the Spirit. Last week in Romans chapter 8, we talked about uh, living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So if we are maturing and living under the influence of the Holy Spirit, what that means for us is we will begin to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. We will know that we are developing, maturing, being formed. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is the big idea for today that I want us to grab hold of. As we mature, we will inevitably, underline that word, that's an important word, we will inevitably become the kind of Christian who exhibits particular virtues in character. As we mature, we will inevitably become the kind of Christian who exhibits particular virtues and character. So let's look at this together. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But... The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. The word of the Lord. If you're reading that and you're following along, you might notice some themes that we kind of carried over from last week, where Paul talks about walking in the Spirit and not gratifying the desires of the flesh. And really, there's two things that I think Paul is getting at in this passage. The first thing is this, who we're not. The first thing that Paul tells us 
is who we are not. If we are in Jesus, if we have been saved by him, and if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we are a particular kind of people. We are not these people. We are not people who live according to our past. Everybody say past. Fallen. Say fallen. Self. Paul tells us we are not people who live according to our past fallen self. Go back and look at verses 16 through 18. He writes, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Pay attention to verse 17, the comparison that he makes. He says, For the desires of the flesh are against the what? Spirit. And then he goes and says, The desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what's important for us to understand, if we're not supposed to live according to our past fallen self, what then is our past fallen self? Last week we talked about this in Romans chapter 8. When Paul talks about our flesh, he's not talking about the stuff that's on our bones. That makes up our body what he's talking about is our nature that each and every one of us regardless of background regardless of who you are regardless of your training regardless of anything you and I we all have a fallen self or a sinful nature another way to think about our flesh is we have an inclination to sin Meaning that we are inclined to sin and eventually it will lead to us actually sinning. Sooner, by the way, than later. So we have this sinful nature that inclines us to sin. And even as followers of Jesus, even being under the Holy Spirit, we still have that inclination. That's why Paul talks about this kind of war that's waging inside of us between the spirit that's leading us and the sinful nature that is in us. But Paul tells us that we're not to live according to that sinful nature. And by the way, this wasn't an idea particularly new to Paul. Jesus himself talked about this in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus describes our sin nature like this. He says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. See, what Jesus is getting at, and I think what Paul is getting at, is that there is a source to our sinful action. And the source of our sinful action is our sinful nature. It inclines us to sin. It's why we need the gospel. That's why we need the good news of Jesus, Jesus coming for us, dying on the cross to free us from sin, to free us from the penalty of sin, to free us from that inclination of sin. He rose from the grave to give us life. We need that new life in order to be free from our sinful nature. And Paul goes on to describe what the sinful nature leads to. The kind of acts that you and I, if we follow Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit in us, the kind of acts we're not called to live out. He says things like this. These are the works of the flesh. He breaks down, I think, several things. One being sexual sin. When he talks about things like non-marital sex, moral impurity, or a lack of self-control. He talks about idolatrous sin. Opening ourselves up to dark powers or even magic. And by the way, I want to recommend uh, a resource, a book to you, if you're unfamiliar with this. There's a book by Andy Crouch called The Life We're Looking For. You might read something where Paul says sorcery or magic, and you might be thinking like, well, that's clearly not an issue in 21st century Western America. Andy Crouch has an incredible thought about how we're still inclined to magic. We just find it in that little glittering device in our pocket called a phone. Very interesting stuff. So Paul tells us that there's idolatrous sin. The focus in this passage, I think, is on the relational sin. Do you know how much Paul talks about this? Things like hostility, anger, jealousy, bursts of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, rivalries, envy. And then he goes on to talk about intemperate sins. Things like drunkenness or parties. 
Now, here's what I want you to notice what Paul does here. He talks about the works of the flesh. In just a moment, we're going to compare that to the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's interesting what Paul does here by, number one, calling them works in that they are things that we do. They're actions. And he also calls them works being plural. And that there are a multitude of things that we do, different works of the flesh. That's important to hold on to when we begin to compare them to the fruit of the Spirit. So Paul says it's the works of the flesh that we are not. And he says that our past fallen self is evident. If you go back and you look at verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, meaning they're not hidden. That when you look out, it's obvious to see that these things are wrong. These things are inherently sinful. These things are inherently evil. And I would encourage you to think about that even in our culture, while some of these sins or the sins that our culture wrestles with might not seem evident, they are. The way that I think about it sometimes is that our culture is too busy staring at the sun that they're blinded by the sun to see what reality actually looks like. To see that the sins that we wrestle with, these sins and other sins, are in fact very evident. Paul says the works of the flesh are evident, and one of the most interesting things about the works of the flesh is how selfish they are. In fact, I think you could make the argument that sin is, in and of itself, its very nature is selfish. That when we want to commit sin, we commit sin because of us, what we want. Listen to what N.T. Wright says about this. He says, perhaps the sharpest contrast is that the works of the flesh are all looking inward. They're all about me. Listen to how he describes each one of these works. Sexual immorality uses another person to gratify one's own desires, even if it's pornography. You're using someone to gratify your desire. Idolatry and sorcery are attempts to manipulate the world into the shape I would like it to be. Hostility, anger, and a party spirit are all about me and my friends squaring off against some other group. Drunkenness enables me to sink into a, priv a private world, and though the wild parties may give an appearance of togetherness, they're hollow at the core. A glossy parody of real friendship. So what I think Paul is getting at, and what N.T. Wright shows us, is that the works of the flesh that we sometimes deal with and wrestle with, it's really just about me. It's about us. It's about what I want and not what's good for anybody else. Now hold on to that as we think about the fruit of the Spirit in just a moment. So Paul says, the works of the flesh, these are the things that we are not. So if those are not who we are, what do we do with them? How do we manage them? How do we handle them? How do we ultimately get rid of them? Paul says, crucify your sinful self. Look at verse 24 of Galatians chapter 5. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, Paul wrote this letter probably some 20 years after the death of Jesus. And Jesus died by how? Crucifixion. And for the record, if you don't know this, crucifixion was not something that was cool in the ancient world. In fact, it was painful, we get the word excruciating from the word for crucify, and it was a public shaming. People were crucified not only to be killed and executed, but to be publicly shamed. And so it's interesting that Paul uses this word to begin to talk about how we, you and I, are to deal with our sin. Just as Jesus was crucified for our sin, we are now called to crucify our sinful flesh. And you cannot, listen to me, you cannot separate the crucifixion of Jesus 
from you crucifying your sinful flesh. Look at how Paul describes this in Romans chapter 6, verses 5 through 11. Look, listen to the language. He writes, for we have been united with him in a death like his. We shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. Look at verse 6. We know that our old self, what's the old self? The flesh. We know that our old self was what? Everybody say it. Crucified with him in order that the body of sin, our sinful nature and our sinful acts, that they might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Are the works of the flesh not being enslaved to sin? They're the same thing. So Paul says, our old sinful self, our sinful nature, our sinful acts, all of those were crucified with Jesus on the cross. Verse 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, we will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. That's what happened to Jesus. So now for us, so you also must consider yourselves what? Dead. Dead to sin. And what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, the good news of Jesus is that Jesus was able to come to earth, he is God, and put on flesh, and lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet he went to the cross, not for his sins, but for our sins. And he died on the cross, and our sins, our sinful nature, and our sins that we've committed, that we have committed, will commit, every sin put on him. And then, his perfectness, his holiness his righteousness is given to us so jesus dies not to his sin but to our sin and then the the gospels tell us that he rises from the grave coming back to life to give us life now the way the scriptures describe it and what paul is understanding in all of his letters is that there has to be a response to this gospel. There has to be a recognition of your sinful nature and your sinful acts, that you have done things that are contrary to the way of God. And that's called repentance, where you acknowledge those things and then you turn away from that way of life. The works of the flesh, they're not for me. This is not who I am. And then in faith, you turn to the cross. You turn to Jesus. You turn to the empty grave. And you trust that his death on the cross took away your sins. His resurrection from the grave gives you life. And that's the life in which we live. And the reason, this is what I want you to tie together. The reason that you and I, right now, in this moment, in our lives, the reason we are able to crucify our sinful flesh, put to death our sinful flesh, is because our sinful flesh and our sins were put on Christ on the cross. Do you see that tie? So what Paul's not saying is, hey, pull yourself together, get it all together, figure it out, take care of your own sins. Paul's just saying, remember last week in Romans chapter 8, we talked about our identity with Christ. If your identity is in Christ, then what it means is, is by the power of God in you, the Holy Spirit in you, you are able to crucify your flesh because it was already taken care of on the cross of Jesus. That's what Paul's getting at. So, we are to become people whose what aligns with their who. Another way to think about that is our actions should align with our identity. If our sins have in fact been taken care of on the cross, then it means we no longer live according to the works of the flesh. We live a different way, which is where Paul goes next. If that's not who we are, then Paul next addresses who we 
In Galatians 5, chapter 5, we are told that we are people who live according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. That followers of Jesus, Christians, we live according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We follow the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is who? God. Paul says it like this, again, going back to verses 16 through 18. He says, but I say walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the what? Of the what? Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what does the leading of the Holy Spirit do? Paul says it produces what? Not works, but fruit. Now notice what Paul is doing here. I want you to see this. Previously, he was talking about the works of the flesh. Works, meaning we do them, plural, meaning there are a lot of them. But here, Paul does something different. He calls them what? Fruit. Meaning they're singular. And they're not necessarily things that we do, but they're things that begin to happen. When he talks about the fruit, I think what he's getting at, you could look at all of these characteristics together, this singular fruit, and what you get is a picture of the kind of Christian we are called to be. Or another word that we use often in our culture, we're getting at character. That when the world looks outside in the inside of us, they see a particular kind of person, a particular kind of character the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are virtues, right? These would have not been uncommon to the ancient world, although some of them would have been different and unique. And there's a particular point that Paul's trying to make by putting love at the top. To say love is the core virtue. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says there are three core virtues to the Christian life. What are they? Faith, hope, love. See, what he's getting at is, again, when the world looks at us, they they should see a particular kind of person. And we should begin to acknowledge... That this kind of person is a gift from God and a work of us. Now, you might hear that and you might think, wait, I thought that those two ideas are opposed to each other. They're not. What Paul's getting at is that these are given to us. They're graces to us. There's a reason that they're not called works of the flesh, but fruit of the who? Spirit, meaning who do they come from? The Spirit, God. So they are gifts to us, meaning there's a part of these fruit that there's absolutely nothing that you're able to do. Right? You can't work yourself into trying to be more loving. You can't work yourself into trying to be more self-controlled or to have more joy or more peace or more patience or more kindness, goodness. You can't work like it is a gift. It is called grace. It's a reason that it is a fruit of the Spirit. But at the same time, the thing about virtues that inter- that's interesting is it is not only a gift, it is a work. Meaning there are things that you and I have to do in our lives to cultivate these sort of gifts. I think there's a reason that Paul uses the metaphor of fruit here. I've shared my gardening, right? It hasn't gone well in the past. In fact, I have a a Satsuma tree that was just planted like two months ago in my backyard. And then, you know, like literally I planted that tree and then like two weeks later we had that hard freeze. So I'm like, I've got to do everything I've got to do to save this baby tree. So I go out and I get a sheet 
and I put the sheet over it and I tie the sheet around it so it won't fall off. But the tree is so small and such a baby that the, the weight of the sheet breaks the tallest limb on the tree. And then my dog goes outside thinking, hey, this is interesting. I've never seen this sheeted tree before, so I'll grab it and rip it out of the ground. In that moment, I recognize, listen, that tree and the fruit that will be produced on that tree is not just a gift in that God is going to have to use the nutrients of the soil and bring sunlight on that plant and bring water to the earth for it to grow, but I've got to do something. First and foremost, I've just got to keep it in the ground. The fruit of the Spirit is the same way. There's work to be done. It's a gift. It comes from the Holy Spirit. But then in our lives, there are things that we can do to begin to cultivate that fruit. It is both a gift and a work. Here's the good news. The tree is in the ground. And yesterday I went outside and I noticed there are little green leaflets growing on it. I'm like, it's alive. It's breathing. And again, here's the interesting dynamic between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh are selfish. The fruit of the Spirit is selfless. Again, look at what N.T. Wright says about this. He says, by contrast, same quote, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Most of the fruit of the Spirit is explicitly outward facing. Not only do these require other people if they're to be practiced, they're specifically looking out into the wider world and community. They are, in the technical language, exocentric. They orient the person toward others. So the kind of work that God is doing in our heart and our life to change us, to give us love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that kind of maturity is most seen when we begin to exhibit that fruit around other people. The only way that someone is going to know whether or not you are loving or not is how you what? Treat other people. The only way that people are going to know whether or not you are patient or not is how you are patient around other people. The only way that people are going to know whether or not you are gentle is how you are gentle around other people. So I think this is so important for you and I because one of the things that we can get caught up in is when we begin to think about spiritual maturity, we think about ourselves. We think about, man, if I'm spiritually mature, then I know a bunch of stuff or I'm reading my Bible regularly, I'm praying regularly, I'm doing all of these sorts of habits and disciplines. And you know that I talk about the habits all the time. But spiritual maturity will be seen in how we engage and love and serve one another and other people outside of this building. That's what spiritual maturity looks like. So again, if we want to live by the fruit of the Spirit, how do we do it? How do we get there? Paul tells us to follow the Holy Spirit. Verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Notice there's two ideas here. I think we get these confused sometimes. He says you can live by the Spirit, but you also have to keep in step with the Spirit. If you're a Christian, that means the Holy Spirit is where? In you. And Paul's not denying that. Paul's affirming that. Listen, live by the Spirit. But if you're going to live by the Spirit, if you're going to have the Holy Spirit, then you have to do what? Keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So what Paul, I think, is getting at is you can have the Holy Spirit, but not keep in step with the Holy Spirit. So just because you have the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you're living by the Holy Spirit or following the Holy Spirit. Think about the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when the people of Israel come out of captivity and they're going into the wilderness, one of the things that happens is there is a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of cloud of, or a pillar of fire by night. They have the presence of God. 
They don't have to follow it. They choose to follow it. In the same way, as a Christian, you might have the Holy Spirit, but you have to make a choice to follow His leading. And if you're going to follow the Holy Spirit, that means you have to listen to the Holy Spirit. You have to know that He's speaking. You have to know what He's speaking. You have to listen. Things like Bible and prayer, things like community, things like silence and solitude, these things put us in a position to hear and listen to the Holy Spirit. Because the way that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter talk about Scripture is that it is inspired by God. So if this book is actually inspired by God, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, meaning every word in it from Genesis to Revelation is a gift and a message from Him. So one of the ways that we can begin to hear from God is to read this book, listen to this book. He's given us prayer for us to communicate with Him and to hear from Him. He's given us community, one another, right? If I have the Holy Spirit and you have the Holy Spirit, is it the same Holy Spirit? Yes. The answer to that question is always yes. And if we both have the same Holy Spirit, what that means is God can use us to communicate to one another. We just have to listen to one another. And sometimes, the voices around us are so loud that the only way to hear from God is to step back and be alone and be quiet and hear God speak. If we are going to follow the Holy Spirit, we have to listen And if we're going to follow the Holy Spirit, more importantly, we have to obey the Holy Spirit. If he's telling us what to do, that means we have to live according to the way that he wants us to live. And look, sometimes you don't have to see a burning bush to know what God is saying. You read the word. If you're participating in the works of the flesh that Paul discussed... In Galatians chapter 5, I can already tell you what God is telling you. He's telling you right now, stop. If your life is not characterized by love, peace, joy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, he's telling you to change. Because that's the kind of life we're called to live as Christians. Become people whose what comes from their who. Again, another way to think about it is because of who we are in Jesus, our identity, what flows from our identity is our actions. If this is who we are in Jesus, if this is what God has given us by His Holy Spirit, then we are called to be people who exhibit Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So what does that look like for us this week? I want to close like I've been closing the last few weeks, give you some questions to process and give you some next steps to consider. Number one, how are you crucifying your sin? Paul talked about the works of the flesh and that the way... To avoid those works of the flesh is to crucify our sin. What does that look like for you? How are you putting to death the sin that you're wrestling with? Number two, where do you see the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Maybe a good next step this week is just simply begin to walk through each of the fruits. Is there an area in your life where you're seeing each one of those fruits? Maybe you're seeing the opposite. And you have to begin to ask yourself why. Lastly, how are you following the Holy Spirit? What does this look like for you? 
Begin to think about things that I talked about, Bible reading, prayer, community, silence and solitude. What are those things that are putting you in a posture for you to be able to hear the Holy Spirit and follow the Holy Spirit and obey the Holy Spirit? Some next steps. Number one, we talked about this already, silence and solitude. Some of you, you're living in too much noise. And the only way to begin to hear from the Lord is to remove all of the noise to hear his voice. And number two, if you're going to hear his voice, then one of the things that you might need to begin to do is practice regular reflection. I think this can be prayer. Maybe it's journaling. You're beginning to journal your prayers. God, what are you telling me? What are you showing me? How do you want me to live? And lastly, and you might not see the connection, but there, there's a connection there. Serve and disciple others. If you want to be a mature Christian, the Christian life cannot be about you. But Galatians 5 is ultimately about the community. It's about the church. And so Paul is telling the Galatian church, like, listen, love, joy, peace, patience, God, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that's what this church should look like. And if those are all corporate things, the only way to begin to exhibit those things is around other people. And some of you, you have the fruit in you. You have all of those things that Paul talks about, but you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to use those fruit in your life for the benefit of other people. Some of you are mature enough that you could be walking with a brand new Christian, helping them understand what it looks like to be a Christian. All of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, have the ability to serve in some capacity. I think for all of us, like if you want to be spiritually mature, begin to serve. Begin to look outside of yourself. Because ultimately, the Christian life is not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. And it's about the world outside of us that God wants to reach. When we begin to look outside of ourselves, then we begin to mature. You know who we are. You know who we're not. Follow the Holy Spirit and lean in to the kind of people that God wants us to be. Mature, developed, formed followers of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you, God, that not only is our salvation a gift from you, but our maturity is a gift from you. God, as we are about to leave this place and live the rest of our lives for Sunday through Saturday, God, help us to make the, the necessary decisions. Help us to take the necessary actions to work out our salvation to cultivate, God, the fruit that you've given us so that we can become the kind of people you want us to be. Father, I pray that in due time we can look around this room and all of us can say we are people marked by the fruit of the Spirit. Help us be those kinds of people. We love you, and we ask all this in Jesus' name.